lights out in the back room. Fuck Be like test beds for a These kids are making these robots. Of course. That's crazy. It doesn't need to be. Uh, four people can fly in it. Eventually, we may put a seat here and have. Um, presidents. <laughs> presidents. <laughs> vice presidents. <laughs> Bieber. That, just, that was just. I thought that was just for Bieber. Man, I have, a, uh, I have a treat today. Um, a former athlete turned lieutenant commander, naval aviator, and NASA astronaut. Yes, sir. Victor Glover. Yeah. How you doing today, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. It's insane. I, uh, this, this got set up because of good old Twitter. Uh, I hit you on Twitter, <laughs> and I was like, would you, would, you, would you bless me with your presence on my podcast? And you agreed. Yes. That's insane, man. I appreciate it, man. So... No, it's a pleasure to have you here. This is this is awesome. I have never talked to an astronaut before. <laughs> this is insane. Well, we're changing that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, sir. For sure, I agree. For sure. I agree. So I don't think I've had a, like a sit down one on one with uh, uh, an NFL player either. So you know, we uh, all kind of life goals getting checked. Yeah, we crossing we crossing <laughs> new uh, new goals off the, the list today. So um, what? I mean, because obviously it had to be a journey to get to this point. Because when we're all kids, it you start out. And that's one of the, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm going to be an astronaut. It's one of those far-fetched goals that you have. So how did that come to fruition? Like, take me through your, your life path. Okay. And it's interesting because uh, well, I would just go back to, to elementary school and seeing a, a space shuttle launch. And I thought, I want to drive that. You know, it looked so amazing. And it was such an interesting thing to see people leave the planet. I mean, I saw it on television. I wasn't even there in person. But um, that, that I would say went into that bucket of, like you said, that when you're a kid, you, you, you can be audacious. You can have those big dreams, you know, and, and I've been fortunate to be able to live some of those. Yeah. And I, so it, it reminds me that even as an adult, sometimes we still have to be audacious. We limit ourselves. And so, um, but I, I would say it, go, it went into the bucket of I also want to be a stuntman. I wanted to be a professional athlete. Um, and so I didn't really see a path to there. But I went to college and my decision making going to college, I wanted to go to USC. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because of their engineering program. It was because that's where Marcus Allen went. Hey. <laughs> and I wanted to be Marcus Allen. Hey. So we all did. <laughs> yeah. At 16, that's where I was at. Right. Uh, I wound up going to Cal Poly. I went, uh, it was between the G Gainesville University of Florida and Cal Poly. Cal Poly offered me a wrestling scholarship, Gainesville an academic scholarship, and I wanted to stay a little closer to home, mm. Southern California. So I went to Cal Poly. And luckily, um, my mentors and, and the folks that I worked with, I, they kept me in the books, but I also got to play Division One sports. I played football and I wrestled. And it was really athletics for me that it was that team, that camaraderie and that sense of accomplishment or defeat that drove you back to the gym, that just people don't really get anywhere other than athletics mm. and that intensity that when I was looking at a career, about my junior year, I was like, I don't really want to sit at a desk and do drafting work. I was studying engineering. Right. And so I wanted to do something different. And engineering opened so many doors. Right, right. And I tell folks, you know, when I go out and talk, kids, engineering is a path to whatever you want to do. You can design roller coasters for Disney or draft cartoons, you know, technical drawings and stuff for, for uh, you can do animation. There's so many things you can do with engineering and science degrees. And so luckily I had the tools. But I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Right. One of my mentors shows up one day in a Navy uniform. He was a reservist. And he talked to me about it, and it turns out I was like, that sounds like some adventure. Mm -hmm. And kind of that team, that camaraderie. And uh, so I said, all right, I want to be a Navy SEAL or a pilot. Oof. And, and I tell you. Kind of opposite ends of the. Uh, but, you know, for me at the time, I didn't know a whole lot about it. I right. just thought those both sounded tense. Right. And it might be fun. I was looking for adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say, if I had to rank them at that time, right. I was 20. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Navy SEAL was winning. Yeah, for, so sure, for sure. My dad and I had a, a long talk. We had a heart to heart. And I was like, OK, engineering. My dad actually said this to me when I was 20. He said, you know, with an engineering degree 
and being a military pilot, you know, you might mess around and be an astronaut. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, very Pops interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, and so about that time, I started on this journey to become a naval aviator, became a pilot, went to test pilot school, became a test pilot. And while I was in test pilot school, I saw Pam Melroy. She was the uh, one of the first female space shuttle commanders. She gave a talk about one of her missions, and it just blew me away. And what it, it rekindled that that childish ambition, and it really, but it it focused it though. Right. It was just as powerful, but it was now focused. And I had already taken some of those steps. I had a professional career. I had an engineering degree. I had some work experience. I had the minimum qualifications, right. and so it, that's when it really became a pursuit. When right. I said, with both hands. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ride this train and see where it goes. And um, I was very fortunate it worked out. And in 2013, Definitely. I showed up here and... So what was the, what was the process like? Because uh, you, you say class of 2013, right? 2013. So not everybody knows how astronauts get selected or how, how, how it happens or how many astronauts there are in the world. So how, yeah. how, many, how many NASA astronauts there are there right now? I believe we have 44 right now. 44, you're one of 44 NASA astronauts. Yes. So how does that selection process happen? Is there a test or how does it? Uh, lots of little tests. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and they never really stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a test Everything is a test. Life is a test. <laughs> right. uh, it, so it's, it's a, it was a two year process if you started in the military because the military had a selection before. Now I think everyone will generally apply to USA Jobs, the okay. website, the, the system to a, it, really? apply for any government job, right? Wow. But it's uh, an open call and the minimum requirements are a bachelor's degree in STEM, really science, engineering, and mathematics, um, and three years of work experience. Really? It, flight experience is not a requirement. You don't have to be a CB ham you know, operator. You just have to have a degree in, a, in the work experience, the right degree in work experience. Now, the minimums generally don't get you far when you're doing something right, very right, competitive, right, right. but those are the minimums. And so about a year out, I would say, they open a little earlier than a year, they open up this application pool. And for this last class, 2017, right. we have folks in training right now, a little over six months in. We got 18,354 applications yeah, as you should. for 12 spots, right? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you made a comment earlier about the, the combination of the, the left and right side of the brain and the public, you know, you see TV shows that are throwing really deep concepts in, that are science uh, and engineering based at you and, and it's really holding. And you'll see movies that are throwing scientific and exploration concepts at folks right. without a lot of the drama and love stories or murder and death mm -hmm. and they're doing well in the theaters. Right. And so that's, that's very promising, it's very encouraging. And uh, anyway, so the, the uh, a year and a half out, they open up this application and folks apply. And that's one of the reasons I think you had so many apply because of a lot of the popular media. Yeah. And we then read through, well, we sift through a few that don't meet the minimum qualifications. And I think there was something like 16,000 or 15,000 that really had to be considered. Right. So you rack them and stack them and look for the, the, the best ones and you pull them down into a smaller group of about 500. You turn that into a group of about 120 interviewees, and the people come out for the first round of interviews in groups of 10 or so, and they do a three-day interview. You overlap on Wednesday, and so you really have an hour to sit down with this group of folks and, and let them get to know who you are. And during uh, those interviews, uh, they don't do a whole lot of medical stuff. It's just uh, uh, really a, a one-hour interview where you get to know the folks, right, right. and there is uh, some paperwork. The second round interview, I'd be if you make it right back, there. I hate paperwork, <laughs> hey, bro. you never. Well, no, it's not. It's not a lot of paperwork for you. You just start some paperwork, yeah. but it's really the interview. The interview is is a big part of it, um, and so then they grit, bring that group down to about fifty, and then they have the second round interview. And at this point, all of those people are qualified. Yeah. All of those people could do the job in that hundred and twenty group. They probably could all do the job. But now you're bringing them back and saying, who can we put together to be this class? Who is going to be the future of the astronaut corps? And so then they come back and we put them through this uh, uh, set of activities where they have to go out and find and assemble things in teams. Uh, we, we give them a psychological evaluation, kind of like personality tests, if you've right. ever taken those. Right, right, right. Um, they, they have a few different tests. There's a language aptitude <clears throat> test. Uh, which is not a test of a specific language, but just your ability to acquire language. Right. Language is, training is a big part of what right. we do. Right. You want to see folks that are well-rounded, technical, uh, operational, have an affinity and respect for foreign cultures right. and just people in general. Right. They can speak no extemporaneously. <laughs> they, really, we've had a problem with that. So, yes, you said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm putting a lot of words on it. You said it directly. Yeah, sure. and so that's one of the reasons the interview is so important, right? Because right. on paper, this person can look great. Right. And you get in the room with them, and it's just like, that was nails on a chalkboard a little bit. So, right. um, and then after that process, uh, they have the really challenging duty of trying to put together a class. And this 
time it turned out to be 12 folks, 12 NASA astronauts plus two Canadian astronaut candidates. Okay. And so we've got these 14 folks going through training now and they'll train in for two years. The basic things they train on are uh, international space station systems. They learn to spacewalk, they speak Russian, learn to fly the T-38, our high performance jet, uh, and they have to learn to operate, to fly, we call it our robotic arm. So why, not to cut you off, but so why do they have to speak Russian? Like why is that the language? The international space station, the two, it's, it's 15 to 18 partner countries, depending on how you look at it. And the uh, the two big partners are U.S. and Russia. And so half of the space station was made by Russian aerospace companies. So okay. the buttons are in Russian. There's Cyrillic characters on them. So the, I, so the ISS is, uh, it's a worldwide conglomeration. Yes, it is an international space station. The, the, See, so half of it is, it, you, we say half is called the Russian segment and the other half is called the U.S. orbital segment. But the U.S portion has a laboratory built by the European Space Agency, right. which is a bunch of countries, and then the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency has a module there as well. Right. And then the robotic arm on the space station was made by the Canadian Space Agency and Canadian wow. Aerospace Company. So, it, and, no then, and then the complement, the crew complement, can be six people uh, or more from all those different partner nations. Right. So it, it really is an international effort. And so not just the foreign language. Russian is the main, you know, the procedures are written in English and Russian. Okay. The <clears> spacecraft <throat> we fly to the station at this time, the current time, is a Russian spacecraft. So we spend a lot of time in Russia. And you have to be familiar with the language and culture. But really, it? all the languages and cultures, Japanese. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say Japanese. Germany is where the other space. You, you have to just have an appreciation right. uh, for the international piece of the space station. And one thing I didn't say earlier about the selection, the way the flight rate and the size of the core, uh, there was a National Research Council report a few years back that determined the size of the astronaut office needed to be about 55 to 60 people. Right. And so the office is smaller and because of the attrition rate, we, we generally uh, will select folks every four to five years. And that's, you know, that's one of the challenging things about it is you kind of have a window. Right. I mean, there's no minimum age or maximum age, but yeah. you know, we generally pull people in about 35. And so there's kind of a, a sweet spot.